Thank you for attending this session. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about linear programming. In the previous talk, we discussed a theory of constraint. Indeed, linear programming precedes theory of constraint. And then the question is if theory of constraints brings something to the linear programming table. The answer is it depends because linear programming has uh, rigorous mathematical foundations and theory of constraint was developed later. But if I want to say what is it the theory of constraint brings to the linear programming table, I could have said theory of constraint tries to add more uh, managerial taste to uh, linear programming. That's one. Uh, to say, okay, look, look here, look there, find your binding constraint. In linear programming, we call bottleneck binding constraint, and there may be several binding constraints. So, okay, look, find your binding constraint, focus on relaxing the binding constraint or binding constraints. The second thing that I believe a theory of constraint brings to the linear programming table is, look, you set your objective function as profit maximization or cost minimization. Practice to do it as profit maximization. Or in other words, in tier of constraints terms in throughput objective function, try to maximize your throughput. One other thing the theory of constraint brings to linear programming table is don't forget never include fixed cost as a function of volume of production. Indeed, just keep it out of your objective function. Deal with the uh, variable cost after to, uh, you are done, then go and incorporate fixed cost. We go to the same problem that we discussed it before. We have two products, product P, which we sell it for $90, and product Q, which we sell it for $100. And then the total cost of product P is $20 here, $20 here, and $5 here, so I should subtract $45 from P. And for product Q, this $20 here and $20 here, so I should subtract $40 for Q. These are variable costs and the others are sales price. In objective function of linear programming, I should only put those items which are directly and proportionally related to the volume of production. Therefore, my conclusion up to now, as it was in my example for the theory of constraint, is each unit of product P earns me $45. That is contribution margin. For each unit, I can put that much money into my company's pocket. And for product Q, that is $60 for each unit. I should use this revenue, this uh, financial throughput, to recover for $6,000 fixed cost and after that to produce a profit. If I want to have a pictorial representation of this problem, Raw material one comes, go to A, then C, then D, and then is ready. Raw material two goes to B, and then C, and then D, and is over there. Purchase part comes to D, and then it goes out, and these three components together form one unit of product P. Product Q does not have the last part. It has 
raw material three, which goes to A, then B, then D, and then it will be added to raw material two, and then they will form product Q. Therefore, if I compute how much time in of this part spent in each department, department A, B, C, and D, these are the time A, A, B, B, C, C, and D, D. If I add these minutes together, I would have this result, and we have already computed that. Profit margins are 45 and 60. Now I am going to develop a linear programming model for this problem. I have product P, which goes to department A, B, C, D. I have product Q, which goes to A, B, C, and D. Capacity of all stations are known, 2,400 per week. That is 60 minutes, 8 hours, and 5 days per week. That is the capacity. Demand per week for product P is 100, and for product Q is 50. Profit margins, we have it here. Now let us define our decision variables. I define decision variable P as a volume of production of product P. I define decision variable Q as volume of production for product Q. This is a key part of any linear programming formulation. Then regarding resource A, I should write a constraint. Part P needs 15 minutes in resource A, and part Q or product Q needs 10 minutes in resource A, correct? So 15 is how much each unit of product P needs, plus times the number of units of production of product P, times 10, which is the number of minutes product Q needs, in station A or in a work center A, that is volume needed. This should be less than or equal to what I have over here, 2400. Fifteen P plus ten Q less than 2400. Now I need to write the same relationship for work center B, station B, and that would be 15 times P plus 30 times Q. The left hand side is what I need, the right hand side is what I have. Now I should go for department C, that is 15 P plus 5 Q, less than or equal to 2400, and then I should go to department D, that is 15p plus 5q less than 20, less than or equal. In all of these equations, we don't have less than or greater. We have less than or equal, greater or equal, or equal. So that is for department D. Then we have market constraint. We cannot sell more than 100 units of product P, and we cannot sell more than 50 units of product Q. So that is our market constraints for product P and product Q. And then because usually we give this linear programming model to a computer uh, to solve it, and that computer does not know that we cannot have negative production. For example, if product P is more profitable, computer may produce negative one million product P, and because it's producing negative values, because this side for P, for example, becomes a negative number, that negative number could go this side and become positive. Therefore, this 2400 may become 24,000. I should also tell computer that volume of production P should be greater than or equal to zero 
and volume of production of product Q should be greater than or equal to zero. Don't forget, we only have less than or equal, greater than or equal, or equal. We don't have inequalities like this. Now, the objective function, what is it I want to maximize? My objective function is 45p plus 60q. That is what I want to maximize. And I write it. Of course, I also have a fixed cost. But it really doesn't matter if I put it into objective function from the beginning or I just subtract it at the end. Here I have put it from the beginning because that 6,000 does not depend on how many P, how many Q. It is independent. It is always there. I can include it into my objective function from the beginning or at the end when I solve the problem. And then non-negativity constraints. P and Q decision variables. These are our decision variables. We call these all of these and here Functional constraints, objective function, non-negativity constraints. We defined four terms. Decision variables, functional constraints, non-negativity constraints, and objective function. Now I'm going to implement this problem in Excel. You will see that how solving the problem in Excel using solver become easier. Uh, then why I approach the problem from the theory of constraint point of view, why linear programming precedes theory of constraint. The whole idea was because, frankly, you will not be involved in developing mathematical models. Therefore, theory of constraint develops that taste of looking for constraints. What is it which holds the organization moving forward? For example, in our undergraduate studies, the binding constraint is scheduled availability of our student and net availability. Schedule availability is the time that they allocate to their education on campus or elsewhere. Net availability is level of focus and concentration during the learning process, whether in face-to-face -face class or in a virtual class. So the idea behind theory of constraint was to equip you with a mindset, with a philosophy that if there are thousand problems over there, you are not responsible to solve all of them. And if you solve 500 of them, they may contribute nothing, nothing in progress of the organization. But maybe if you spend all your time in one or two or three or four constraints, maybe you can come out with a significant impact. Let me show you how we implement this problem in Excel and use solver to find the optimal solution, then do sensitivity analysis and do make some other changes. This is product P, this is product Q. They both need resource A, also resource B and C and D. So here I have done nothing except typing those numbers into Excel to prepare it for solver. Just 
just type the numbers. Here are contribution margins. Sales price 90, variable cost 45, profit margin 45. Sales plus 100, variable cost 40, profit margin 60. So these are the money that I make out of each product. They will first go to recover for this weekly fixed cost and then they go to produce profit. These are, I have just typed them, 2400, and because that is the same for all resources, I have just copied it down. So I have right hand side, and I have this data, and I have these numbers. These, I don't know what they are. This is my first constraint. I type equal to 15 minute per unit of product P, and suppose this is volume of product P plus 10 minutes per unit of product Q and suppose that is product Q that is consumption of resource A. These are my product P and product Q. This is my total profit and this is my production. Now, if I go here and copy this down, it doesn't work because the second one, the volume of production, was not fixed. Therefore, when I copy down, it goes down and it is not what I want. So I'll go back over there. I click on B10, I mark B10 here and lock it F4 and C10 and lock it F4. Now I can copy this down. If this is production of product P and this is production of product Q, therefore this is how much resource A is needed. This is how much resource B is needed. And this is how much resource D is needed. What I can do better instead of doing it like that because I may have 20 products, 30 products, I cannot go on each of them, click this one, multiply by this one, this one, multiply by this one, and so on and so forth. It equal to some product. Some product of what? These two, 15 and 10. One by one by volume of production of P and Q. So 15 is multiplied by volume of production P. 10 is multiplied by volume of production Q. And then I lock these later variables, enter, and I copy it down. Now I am fine. This is what I need. This is what I have. So if I produce 10P and 10Q, that is what I need. If I produce 100P, and 100Q, then some of these exceed what I have. This one exceeds what I have. And of course, this one also exceeds what I need. So it cannot be 100 and 100. This one should be less than or equal to 100. This one less than or equal to 50. So for the time being, let's put 10 and 10. Volume of production of product P should be less than or equal to 100. Therefore, I type one and I type one here for product Q. And then I just copy what I had over there. One multiplied by P plus zero multiplied by Q. Therefore it is P. And that should be less than or equal to 100. And this one is Q because that one is zero. And here I have one. Zero times 10 units of product P becomes zero. One times 10 units of product Q becomes 10. And that 10 should be less than or equal to 50. And then I copy this one also down. And that is my profit multiplication of these two numbers, 45 times 10 and 60 times 10. Let me make one of them 20. Now all of those numbers are changed.
The only thing I need if in my objective function I want to include also fixed cost, profit margin of one unit of product P multiplied by number of units of product P, profit margin of product Q multiplied by the number of units of product Q. That is what has come into this organization. Every week we have $6,000 fixed cost. So this is my objective function. These are my decision variables. These are my internal capacity constraints. And these are my external market constraints. I have entered all the data. Now I need to go and bring solver. I will go to data and solver is there. If solver is not there, you go to options, then you go to add ins, go, and here you click on solver, and then solver will appear here. Now I open solver, Mr. Solver, please look at this number. Solver asked me, do you want me to set it equal to a value? minimize it or maximize it. For example, when we were trying to find alpha in exponential smoothing, we clicked on minimum. Here we want to maximize profit by changing what? By changing production plan of this two product. Under what constraints? Add this one and this one and this one and this one. All of these six constraints because they all are less than or equal, I can declare them all together. If some of them were greater than or equal, equal, I could have not declared them all together. But here, because they are all of the nature of less than or equal, I can declare them all together. Should be greater than or equal? No, less than or equal. Don't forget, this less than or equal here does not play any role. I have put it over there only to remember that those constraints are less than or equal. It is here that I tell Excel explicitly that those left-hand side numbers should be less than or equal to this right-hand side. Okay, and we are done. Now I'm going to solve the theory of constraint quiz that we had in a framework of a linear programming set up. The problem is exactly the same thing, but you will see that the way that I set it up make the solution easier. If you remember those questions which we had in that quiz was asking about what is contribution margin of product P, what is contribution margin of product Q, we have already done this computation. And then the problem asks, what if I set production of product P equal to what it is needed? If I decide to fully satisfy the demand for products P. In that case, I will finally have a hundred here. That is what I need to have because I go and I change that constraint to equal from less than or equal, I set it to equal. And then the question is, under this situation, how many product Q can I produce and what would be the value of objective function? The problem then asks, what if I set the production of product Q equal to what is needed and force linear programming to come out with 50 here and therefore here I have 50. What will happen here? And what would be the result of it? We will answer all these questions easily. First, I come here. I change this to equality. I don't need to change it here because this is only for me to remember. Excel does not look at there. Excel, look at what I enter. So I'll go to data. I go to solver. Objective function is this, which I want to maximize. By changing what, by changing this, 
changing sums, which tells me the production of product P and production of product Q. What are my constraints? I can declare these constraints together, left-hand side, less than or equal to right-hand side. Add market of P production should be equal to demand. Left-hand side equal to right-hand side. And for product Q, it should be less than or equal to 50. Okay. And then I will ask solver to solve this problem and give me the best result under this constraint and satisfying the full demand for product P. So the result is, if you want to produce 100 P, you can produce 30 Q and your total profit would be 300. I record it for future. What is the binding constraint? In linear prime, we can have one binding constraint or 100 binding constraints. All of them do not allow me to reach to a better position for the organization with respect to the corresponding objective function. In this problem, my internal constraint is resource B, that is the bottleneck in D, the terminology of the theory of constraint, and my external bottleneck is also market of product P, demand for product P. Now I'll go, I remove this. I can leave it over there, it doesn't matter. The only thing I should change is I go to solver. This equality, I say change it to less than or equal. Okay. And this last one, which was less than or equal, change it to equal. Okay. This one also, just to remember that what I did is equal to that. Now I give the rest to solver. Solver, please solve. Okay, solver solve it. If we satisfy the total demand for product Q, we can produce 60 product P and our profit goes down from 300 to negative 300. Therefore, we don't do it. It seems that the production of 100 units of product P is a better strategy. I remove this one. I'll go back to solver. I delete this one and delete this one and delete this one. And I declare again, this one and this one and this one and this one, less than or equal to this one and this one and this one and this one. Left hand side, less than or equal to right hand side. Okay, let me close it. We usually show this as left hand side and this one as right hand side. Again, it is not important that I have put here equal and equal because in the solver, I declare what left hand side is less than or equal to what right hand side and what left hand side is equal to what right hand side. Doesn't matter because this is only for me. And indeed, even here, I should have made this one less than or equal when I changed the situation to satisfy the demand for product Q. But this does not matter as long as I have entered my problem correctly inside Solver. Here, Solver used the data inside Excel to come out with the solution. Okay, and that is the optimal solution. And under optimal solution, we make $300 profit. Now suppose I change the demand for product P from 100 to 101. Let's see what would be the change in this 300. It will not be $45 because 
if I produce one extra unit of product P, I should sacrifice some units of product Q because the capacity does not allow me. This resource is already bottleneck. Data solver solve. Okay, profit increased by $15. Why? Because I produced one unit of product P and therefore I gained $45, but I had to leave half a unit of product Q equal to minus 0.5 multiplied by $60 and therefore equal to summation of these two profit went up by $15 not by $45 let me do the same thing for product Q let's make this one 100 and make this one instead of 50 51 solver solve okay no change because I could have produced 15 units of product Q, but I produced only 30. Now, if you allow me to produce 51, I still produce 30. I didn't have enough resources. Here, market of product P is a binding constant, is a bottleneck. If I can relax it, if I can allow it from 100, become 101, 102, my profit went will go up. That is one binding constant. The other binding constant, which is internal, is how much resource do I have? Let me add one day capacity to this. One day is 480, therefore 2400 plus 480, 2880. Let me see if I have one extra day capacity. If instead of five days, for that department, I work six days, for example, just as a possibility. What would be the result on profit? I turn this one back to 50. So I was able to increase my profit from 300, this value, minus 300. I was able to increase my profit by $960. And that was obtained by 180 minutes extra work. For each minute of extra work, I was able to earn $2. Don't forget, in the original form of the problem, When I increase this by one, profit went up by $15. When I increase this one by one, profit went up by $0. We call this shadow price of right hand side. Shadow price of right hand side. If I increase right hand side from what it is by one unit, then the profit will go up by that shadow price of each additional unit of product P, if the market allows, was $15. Shadow price of each additional minute of this resource from 2400 to 24, 1, solver, solve, was $2. I was able to produce 0.033 units of product Q. You may ask, who produces 0.0333? I say no one, but if you produce for 30 days, 30 multiplied by this, then it will become 901. In 30 days, under the previous situation, you could have produced 900, but now you can produce 901. So the system has two bottlenecks, external bottleneck and internal bottleneck. Let's first go and relax the internal bottleneck. 
suppose we go ahead and we double the capacity of the bottleneck. We realize that for each additional unit of the bottleneck, my profit should increase by $2. Therefore, if I am increasing the capacity of my bottleneck by 2400, I expect $4,800 increase in profit. Let's see if it happens, if my profit goes above $5,000. No, it only went to $1,500. So that $2, that conclusion about $2 that I made has a limit, has an upper limit and lower limit. It is correct up to some point. If I reduce that 2400 to 2300 or 2350 that $2 is there. If I increase it, that $2 is there. If I decrease it, $2 is subtracted from the value of objective function for each additional increase. But if I increase the right hand side, then objective function will also go up, but it is not forever. It is for a limit because what will happen then additional bottleneck, additional binding constraint comes up. As we have seen in this situation, now this is also a bottleneck. Now suppose We have found another market which does not have anything with my, our current market and we can sell our product to them at a discount. The first product was sold for $90 and its valuable cost was $4,500 and its valuable cost was $40, therefore contribution margin of this one was the margin of this one was six i solved my problem i had two bottlenecks internal bottleneck and external bottleneck for internal bottleneck i decided to double the capacity went here and replaced 2400 by 48 I found an external market. Over there, I cannot sell my product for $90, but for 80% of $90. And the same for other one. I cannot sell it for 100, but for equal to 80% of 100. So these are my prices in the other market, which does not hammer my current market and these are my contribution margins copy and a special the time that i need for two products are the same i need to adjust this one which should cover all four products and then i copy it down the same for these two, in case if later I decide to put some constraints on. And again for this one. So now the problem is ready. I can go to solver. I should fix my decision variables because now they are not only these two, but these four. And this is the new optimal solution. A very neat observation is here. Look, we have not produced 100 units of product P. Instead, we have produced product Q in the other market why 
why this happened. It was at our benefit to produce product P as much as we can. What happened? Because over there, we were governed by one binding constraint. In the previous situation, we were governed by this binding constraint. And it was 2400 equal to 2400. It is still binding. It is now left hand side is 4800 and right hand side is 4800. Still we are in the same situation. But what actually happened, a second binding constraint appeared. And under the cumulative impact of these two internal binding constraints, it is not at our benefit to uh, produce the product P to fulfill the needs of the internal market or original market. This is a nice observation. I like to stop this talk at this point, but I will discuss more on this problem and we will then also do some sensitivity analysis. I would like you to watch both the theory of constraint introduction lecture that I had and this linear programming introduction lecture. The idea is theory of constraint lecture have a rather managerial look. It doesn't necessarily needs you to learn an optimization model, but it shows you that when you go to an organization, you need to find the bottlenecks, the binding constraint. Where is it? And then put your attempt over there. Put all your attempt over there. Linear programming give you an excellent, robust tool as the mathematical arm of looking for bottlenecks, identifying them, exploit them, subordinate every other things to the binding constraints, find a way to relax them, and then go after other binding constraints. Thank you very much for watching my lectures.